Hello and welcome to History Through Fiction, the podcast. I'm your host, Colin Mustful, and today I'm thrilled to be joined by two authors, Ashley Coles and Daniel Stinson, also known as A.D. Ryan, the author of Daughters of Bronze and Horses of Fire. Uh, Ashley and Danielle, welcome. Thanks Thank so much, you so much for having, for having us. <laughs> Uh, well, I have to admit that I am not a Greek mythology buff or Greek history buff, uh, so you're going to have to fill me in quite a bit. Uh, so let's start with the Trojan War, what people think they know versus what it actually was, if you could uh, explain a little bit for us. Sure. Um, I'll take I'll take this one. I think I uh, the Trojan War is interesting because in the ancient world, it was considered a well-known fact that this was a historical event that happened, and people just took that for granted. It is only uh, more recently that we went through a period where we considered it to be complete mythology, an invention of the Greeks. You know, Homer wrote it down, and it was just the story that they had passed down, but it was considered to be uh, fiction. Uh, but then in, in more recent times, uh, we are coming around back around to the original idea that no, this was in fact based on actual events and that there was a reason. And that's what really compels us is there was a reason that this is one of the oldest epics is a reason that this was passed down and that this is what we have from the late Bronze Age. Uh, and so now they have, most people agree, it tentatively agreed that the site of Troy is at Hisarlik in uh, modern day Turkey. And we are able now to uncover through archaeology and other things so many more uh, interesting aspects about what this actual conflict might have been that inspired uh, the epic that most of us have had to read in high school. Yeah, so that that being the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, and what's kind of interesting for me is I, I studied the Middle Ages um, as a history major. That was my area of focus. And you can see that the presence of this story has con like it's persisted in in Western um, civilization for thousands of years where there's constant references back to this to this war. And I think people in the Middle Ages believed it actually happened as well, that it was a historical event. Um, and so, yes, that our interest in writing this duology was to take that we both have grown up loving the Iliad and the Odyssey, the Iliad especially, um, which recounts the the Ten Year War. And we really wanted to dive into the Bronze Age history and kind of give a historically rooted retelling that asked if this war really happens, like many archaeologists and his, his, uh, historians believe it did, how might it have actually been fought? Would it have differed in certain ways from the mythology? Um, and that's kind of how we approached, you know, the Trojan War. Well, we definitely all know of the Iliad and the Odyssey. And even if we don't know, we know it's it's present in all kinds of stories. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about the, the historical context? When did Homer write these stories in relation to when the events actually happened? And how historical are his stories? That is such a, that is the million dollar question, because he wrote and recorded these things that had been passed down hundreds of years after, after the events probably occurred, but the, either the conflict or the series of conflicts that inspired the Trojan War. So that's roughly placed around, depending on who you ask, 1200 BCE. Um, and so he's writing hundreds of years later, um, and they're, that's when you know they're, they're coming, uh, all these things have been collected. But so the question is, were these stories that were transmitted orally, how faithful were they to what actually happened? Then, how were they compiled? Because in the in the actual lines, we find throwbacks to things that were probably even older. Uh, so mythologies and stories that were even older than the 1200 BC, like the war that they think occurred. So it has this interesting mix of stuff that's from Homer's time, stuff that was probably from around the time that the Trojan War was meant to have occurred, and stuff that's even older. So it's this really interesting, uh, interwoven, messy, uh, conglomerate of, you know, who, how, whoever knows how much history. Uh, and so piecing it, taking it apart and figuring out what came from where and what is actually isolated to the time that we're discussing is what's constantly debated and really fascinating. And what's difficult is, you know, people in the Bronze Age probably didn't have those same categories as we do. The idea that in telling this story that there was supposed to be 
you know, faithfulness to the events exactly as they occurred, as, as modern day historians might, you know, aim for. Um, the goal was to memorize it, to recite it, to to pass pass on a tradition that was completely, I mean, thousands of lines of poetry that was all recited orally from memory. Um, and so that was, you know, the primary goal. And I mean, but there are some interesting things. So if, if I, I believe scholars believe, you know, Homer existed around 800 BCE. And so 1200 to 800, that's a pretty big, <laughs> pretty big period. Um, and there are some interesting things like we know the Hittites were a major empire, a major power around the late Bronze Age. And Homer never mentions them once. Um, which he mentions other groups that were around at the at the time of what you know historians think was the Trojan War, um, but not the Hittites. And so that was something an interesting gap we wanted to play with a lot. You know, the idea that Homer is approaching this story as a Greek poet or you know a a group of Greek Greek poets, and um, so he's approaching it through the lens of of. Greek culture. And so maybe certain things that were important in the Anatolian tradition um, weren't weren't covered or historical groups or or events or, or things that actually existed. He wasn't necessarily looking to include those. And so that left a very interesting gap for us to kind of approach the story to, to, to say, OK, scholars believe the Trojans were based on real people in ancient Anatolia. What was their culture like? Um, why aren't the, what was their relationship with the Hittite empire? And, you know, that's, that's something we were definitely played around with. I just want to say one more quick thing, because I think we want to give Homer just a little bit more credit, even though, you know, we, he, it's amazing. Some of the things that have been passed down in, in the in cultures where uh, histories and entire, like, everything is communicated orally through you know, the oral tradition, the, the way that they use rhyme and meter, all these different, like, tricks to be able to make it easily uh, mem easily memorizable. I can't say that word. Um, <laughs> how they're able to do that, it's, there are some details that are just startling in how accurately they actually reflect the archaeological site that we have. And it isn't until more recent times when they've uncovered more and more that they're seeing how much it actually does line up. Like the sloped walls and the place where the wall was the weakest. And you're like, well, how are we getting these details that are so incredibly real and true? And how has that been passed down? And it's almost miraculous how much of it turns out to be faithful. Yeah, the archaeology is giving a whole new picture to the poem because of how congruent it is. Interesting. Well, I, I definitely want to ask you more about the work you did to put all this together, but I don't want to get too far away from the novel itself. So let's go back to, uh, we're, we're talking now about Daughters of Bronze, um, but tell me about the fiction here. Tell me about the characters you created. Tell me about the story you wrote to share this history. Okay, I'll start with this one. Um, so we have, like I mentioned, we both, have loved the story of the Iliad for a very long time. And we wanted to approach it through our pretty unique background and our friendship. So we have been friends for 25 years. We met on a US Army base in Germany. Both of our fathers were, were soldiers in the US Army um, for most of our <laughs> childhoods. Um, and we met when we were 15 and we really bonded over, you know, a lot of epic stories, Lord of the Rings, um, a lot we of- We were nerds, is what she we said. Yes, very, <laughs> and, and and I think, so we, when we heard the story of the Iliad or when we approached it again as adults, um, we were struck by like how relevant it felt to our own experiences growing up in a military culture, a military community. Um, and even how in the stories of the women in of Troy, how we recognized our um our own mothers, um our our friends, the the people we grew up with, those kind of telling the story from the home front, those who are involved in a war, um, not by their own choice, but because that's that's part of the community they were raised in and and how um that conflict impacts them. So I think that was definitely what drew us to the story, wanting to tell it through that lens and it features um, four women, 
three, actually I, I'll say all four of them are real characters in the Iliad because we 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 took some liberties with uh one of the characters Rhea um but she is actually based off someone in the Iliad that has no name that is given just a few lines uh, a, a a young servant girl um and we you know we wanted to say who is this who is this person what's her story so we have Rhea we have Andromache, who is the wife of Prince Hector, the bulwark of Troy, the um, the commander of Troy's army. We have Helen of Troy or of Sparta, um, and you know probably the most the most famous uh, woman in ancient mythology. And um, we really wanted to to show that she is a character. Of, you know, everyone's heard her name, but no one really knows who she actually is. Um, and then we have Cassandra, the the princess of of Troy, uh, a prophetess who sees Troy's end, um, even though no one will hear her, no one will listen to her. Do you want to add anything, Danielle? Did I miss something? Yeah. So we just wanted to take. Uh, so we have basically, you know, warrior. We have someone who ends up becoming a Trojan spy, Rhea. We have uh, prophetess, and we have all these women who are in the story, but exist in the shadows and what we wanted to say was okay this war was 10 years they're behind these walls more had happened than just the 30 odd days that homer talks about what is going on behind the scenes and we believe that these women had agency and we wanted to say not just that they're there as a victim of circumstance but how are they themselves changing the story especially in the context of anatolian society which uh you know if these people were different from the greeks which we believe they were uh, there's a long history there of powerful women and of agency for women and we wanted to see how are these things how are they affecting the story um, and that's what we wanted to take as our starting point and can you talk a little bit more about adding depth onto these characters you know you mentioned that one of them only has a few lines in in the original story uh, can you talk about the craft you used, maybe just relying on hu your own human experience to bring bring life into these these characters uh, to make them feel real, even though they lived so long ago? Yeah, so this character for us is one of the most important things because everything starts with the voice. And we wanted, and since we wrote these in first person, uh, that really puts you up close and personal with the material and you have to feel it has to feel authentic it was important for us that it was relatable to modern audi audiences but also that it felt authentic in the way these people might have uh, experienced the world or thought about th things in terms of how the world actually worked for them and so it was really important for us to get those voices we had a very good idea of who we thought some of them would be for example Andromache who we are both fangirls of because even in the Iliad she is given Hector trusts her counsel. She is portrayed as a strong figure, but no, in up until now in uh, fiction, we have not seen that portrayal of her the way that we always grew up thinking about her as a strong woman with military background because it's her general husband is coming to her for advice. Um, and so we saw her as sort of the uh, the recipient of all these incredible warrior queen and these strong queens of uh, the Near East and of Anatolia. And we thought she was going to be in that uh, vein. And then Rhea was wonderful. It was so fun for us because she was completely someone that we could just use, let our imagination play. And so we have her coming in as a horse whisperer. She's a horse whisperer from the Anatolian steppe where, you know, th that was part of uh, the Hittites and the people of the steppe where they, they were horse people. And so we got to play with a lot of the history of that part of the world through her perspective and through her life. So she arrives in Troy as a slave, as someone who was taken um, and her backstory and the way that she finds a new place and a home within Hector's household really allowed us to, to kind of make that a coming of age story. So each of these characters are a different place in life. Uh, we have coming of age. We have Helen, who is a mature woman with a, ch a child. We have Andromache, who is on the verge of becoming a mother. We have Cassandra, who, you know, she has her own thinking going on because she's one of the most tragic figures, I think, in, in all of ancient literature. So there were so many things to play with and it wasn't, it was like they honestly started speaking for themselves and uh, we felt like we were just kind of funneling it at one point, uh, which was good when you have two people writing, if the characters come across so strongly that you can both, they feel like they were, they were leading us, which was great because then it was just, you know, we were just doing their bidding. And we've, we've talked about how we, we we've been discussing this story for 
like 10 years and wanting to write it. And I think we felt like we had to live um, through certain experiences, through becoming mothers, um, to, to kind of portray the characters the way we we wanted to to complete to portray them. I think one of the uh, pieces of reader feedback we often get is that they're very complex, <laughs> um, and in the sense of they're complicated, like they're not uh, they're not all likable all of the time, and they make poor decisions sometimes. Um, and then they're all heroic, but heroic in very different ways. And that's something we really wanted to show that heroism doesn't look the same in every circumstance and with with every person. Um, and so I, that that was another element of you know bringing our life experiences into it is I think we've been talking about this book for so long and we've wanted to tell this story for so long, but I think we had to get to a certain point to be able to tell it. And apparently the COVID-19 pandemic when we were trapped at home with all of our kids was when we wanted to escape to the Bronze Age and finally tell it. Can you tell me about the actual logistics of co-authoring a novel? Did you go chapter by chapter assigning each other a chapter? Did you have a shared document? Did you get into disagreements? And uh, did you have like how did can you just tell me how that all works together? Yeah, so we're actually, yeah, we talk about this, what we presented on this, and we're going to be talking about this at the Historical Novel Society um, in Devon this September, September. So the answer is that it gets messy and it is complicated and it's different for every set of authors. But because we've known each other for so long, our first writing manuscripts were shoved into each other's hands. We've been writing to each other since the notes we passed in ninth grade. So we have a level of familiarity with each other and with uh, each other's writing styles that, and a degree of trust. So, cause we are, you know, we're, we're dear friends but we're basically family at this point. And so we, and we were writing very much in one voice cause we had the same thing to say which I think is super important cause it's less about like do the voices and is the plot adding and do all these things come together. But the thing everybody always says when they read it is they can't believe that two people wrote it because not that the voices aren't all different because they are, but because we were so unified in the thing that we were trying to say. And that has to do with theme and all the overarching things. But as far as the characters themselves, we each created two of the voices that were used. But uh, that's it started off. We thought we were going to go back and forth, but it turned into something very, very different. At some we we at some places, it's like very much Ashley's strength. In some places, it's my strength. And in some places, the the writing is almost like bricks layered that we've done. And it was one of the most gratifying and amazing experiences to write with somebody in that way, because it just shows you what is possible with technology now, which I'll let Ashley talk about Google Docs because, you know, it, it's, That's, yeah. that is, you know, to answer your, your, how did we technically do it? We used Google Docs. We are waiting for somebody to create an even because we broke Google Docs, to be honest, it, our our books were so big, um, that and so long, <laughs> that the 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 file started to corrupt at certain points. So we ended up having to like download and save all these different versions. So if anyone is right, going going to co-author with somebody and write a very big epic historical novel, just just keep that in mind. You want to do lots of backing up, um, but it, it. it did work. It did yes, it did work for our purposes. Um, but we are like hoping that somebody's going to create this amazing, you know, software that allows uh, writers to to collaborate in real time, um, and that it can be a very long document. Um, but it was, yeah, it, it it's amazing to think that even twenty years ago, this probably wouldn't have been possible. Um, it's I think that's why uh, people are often interested in our co writing experience because it is such a new thing. You know, artists of all different stripes have been creating together collaborating for centuries but writing has often been thought of as a you know the solitary art form um primarily because doing it with somebody is just kind of it's <laughs> practically speaking a difficult thing to do um so it's interesting now that the technology allows us to be be able to collaborate in two different states you know we don't live anywhere near each other and you know we um we did kind of take it a, a chapter by chapter basis where, you know, one of us would write the first draft of, of a chapter or a scene from one of the characters. And then that kind of gave us the springboard to respond to it in the next character's POV. Um, we, we're, we're coming around to doing a bit more plotting now, 
Um, but I think for Horses of Fire, especially the the first book in the the our Trojan War duology, it was a definitely a little bit more free form where we were, and it was very exciting to do it to to write that way to see what the person had done the day before, and then to jump on and have a whole. Um, it was you know kind of like a writing prompt built in um, where we responded to that character or to the previous the previous scene. Um, but I think going forward, we'll probably do a bit more plotting because there were there was some heavy edits as a result of of doing it that way. Um, but yeah, it's been a wonderful experience and it's just really exciting that this is something other writers can now at least consider. Uh, you have a very unique genre here in that you're you're mixing together mythology and history and you're using archaeology to bring information together. Meanwhile, you have backgrounds in law and in history, but what about the fiction? Like, was that a challenge for you to craft these characters, develop these characters, do plotting, all the all the things that come with creative writing? What were some of those challenges? So we both were published individually uh, prior to our, um, so we've been writing we started off, we both started off writing for young adults. I write more science fiction fantasy as my background. And you know, I've been writing since I was in third grade. It's the, old, the only thing that I've ever wanted to do. And I went to school for, you know, international relations and things. Cause I was like, I got to do something to have a real job before I go and do the thing I actually want to do, which is just create worlds that I can control <laughs> in my own mind. Um, and now all those things do inform my writing, but I feel like that was a very natural thing for both of us because we've both been writing for for so long and Ashley has her background is also is in mostly historical and contemporary young adult um and so we love that um the creativity and I think what we loved about this time period and the ancient the more ancient is because there is more room to both explore and and to research and to use these things but also there is the, there are those spaces that you can then fill in with uh the fiction Ashley do you want to add to that yeah, just that I think it was actually helpful to have written young adult prior to attempting a novel like this, just because we did have four POVs and we wanted to to do it in the first person so that because we knew it was such a big epic story in such a removed period. You know, it's not like World War II where people have a lot of familiarity. It's it's a, it's a bit more obscure for for many readers. And so we thought giving first person voices would make it feel a little bit more intimate um, and young adult is great preparation for that because so much of YA is written in first person um, so yeah I think that was a from the creative writing standpoint that definitely helped prepare us for for this story and what about uh, publishing uh, when you came to an agent with this idea of calling yourself A.D. Ryan and with the novel that you came forward with, did they pick up on it right away? Was it a long process of finding an agent and a publisher? How did that work for you? That's yeah. Go ahead, Ashley. We went. Um, so I, I had an agent at the time who who uh, represents a lot of historical fiction. Um, especially from the perspective of women. And interestingly enough, she didn't really, she she was pretty much like on board <laughs> um, when she saw our sample chapters and there were really any, I, we kind of probably expected more pushback, for, if not from our agent, than from a publisher, you know, like, oh, two authors, this complicates things, but there really, there really wasn't. Mm -mm. It, was, I, it was, yeah, it was pretty seamless to, um, yeah, to, to present the idea. And I think as long as, you know, the, the story feels solidified and feels like it's cohesive, um, I don't necessarily think it's a stumbling block to mm -hmm. publication. Yeah. And I had had, so my agent, my prior agent was, uh, my agency was mostly um, young adult and uh, children's literature. So I knew at that moment, I was already going to make the jump to adult because I was, I'm, I was one of the ones that was always told that they're writing like just on the edge anyway. I'm, they would be crossover type books. And I knew that I wanted to go and I was always pulling back and I wanted to do more. And so I wanted to go adult um, and props to our agent Shannon, because when we were like, Hey, we have a 300,000 novel word partially narrated by a bird. Like it's awesome. Trust us. She did not. She was like, okay, let's have, let's have it. And 
she did give us the invaluable piece of advice to divide that story into two, which is what Ashley was talking about when she said, if we had anticipated the length of it and knew how big in scope it was going to be, we would have planned uh, to, to for two novels to begin with, as opposed to writing it. And I mean, there was a benefit to writing it as one because the beginning and the end are, they were always intended. So it does feel like you're going on a journey that was meant every step was intentional. But uh, yeah, we would have, I think that's what, we're now much more aware of um, length. length. <laughs> well, looking at the reviews, uh, readers are really praising the emotional depth. They love your characters. They love the story. What do you want readers to take away from this duology? That's a great question. Yeah, so many things. I think that th for one of the things is that there's so many different, that for us, our book is mostly features the people that don't get, I mean, all the heroes are there, but we, even the heroes that we explore, like Ajax the Great or, you know, Sarpedon, we wanted to bring in the names of the people that got, got us excited when we read the Iliad that don't always get the, the shine, like the Achilles, the Patroclus, like we wanted to bring in. So even the people that whose names are known uh, are the ones that are lesser known. Uh, and what we wanted to do is we wanted to show that even in times when it feels like people don't have agency or you you don't have an, you know, these women were behind these walls that there's always every choice that you make and your actions that you take have an impact. So we are never powerless. And so we really wanted our books not to feel like these horrible things were happening. We wanted them to feel like these women and the, the experiences that they've had and the, all of the people that were there, that there was a reason that they were there and that the choices that they made impacted the stories that were ultimately told that were ultimately told, even if they were lost to time. Uh, and so, yeah, that was one of the big things for us. Yeah. And that's why it's, it, it, what's exciting is it's a retelling, but it's not just a straightforward retelling. Like we kept the pivotal moments of the Iliad and then we tried to explain, you know, the historical context and really add depth there. But we also wanted to show like the moments that you think, you know, in the original story, maybe they didn't happen for the exact reasons that you think they did, or maybe these these women and the people within the walls of Troy, um, who don't get a lot of screen time, maybe they were influential in ways that you 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 never thought of. And so we hoped to take a story that people are very very familiar with and be true to the spirit of it, and true to the most you know iconic moments, but then kind of explore like why did it happen this way, um, and give some twists that maybe people aren't anticipating. And can you let us in on what you're working on next? We have a couple projects, actually. Um, <laughs> we are, we, so Horses of Fire and Daughters of Bronze are our uh, Troy duology, and that the second part comes out this November. Um, and so now we are continuing along the, um, you know, the focus on women's, untold women's stories and history. Um, and we have a couple uh couple options there. We're going to see which one takes flight with, with publishing. Um, but we have one set in, we'll just say the um, kind of the Anglo-Saxon era, and then another um, post-World War II. So very different time periods, which is mm -hmm. kind of exciting to get to explore a whole new, whole new periods, but we'll see which one we end up pursuing. <laughs> Well, Ashley, Danielle, congratulations on your novels. Congratulations on your journey, just being together all this time and making it happen. Um, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. It's been a pleasure to talk to you about uh, your duology about Troy. Thank you, Colin. It's been great. Thank you so much for having us. <laughs>